We've all experienced the feeling of losing a big pot in a tournament and being left with less than 10 big blinds. It doesn't feel good. But to maximize your EV and MTTs, you'll need to understand what to do when you get really short stacked. If you're struggling with this, this video is for you. To make things easier over the course of this video, we're going to split up our spots into several categories. First in spots where the action folds around to us, facing an open in any position between under the gun one and the button, and then facing an open in the small blind or big blind. Now hopefully you won't find yourself with a micro stack during the chip EV portion of a tournament very often, but just in case you do, let's start by taking a look at some chip EV solutions for situations where we have less than 10 big blinds. An important question we have to ask is, at what stack size do we actually lose our fold equity altogether? After all, it can be tempting to think that as soon as we get below 10 big blinds, an all-in shove is unlikely to get through. But is that really the case? And how would that affect our actual shoving ranges? Well, we can figure that out using our chip EV sims here. If we start with 7 big blinds, which is generally the point where we're playing pure push fold and never limping or min raising, we can see that if we shove from under the gun and it folds around to the big blind, we're actually still getting a fold about three quarters of the time from the big blind. So this allows us to be shoving with hands like 10-9 suited and 9-8 suited, which aren't exactly value hands, but have enough equity when called that they can profitably shove from under the gun here eight-handed when you combine it with the fold equity that we still have. We can also see the same thing happening if we shove from the button because on the button we're able to jam all of these jack high, 10 high, 9 high and lower suited connectors in this region right here that aren't getting called by worse, but still have enough fold equity to jam. Even our button shove is getting a fold fairly often here because once we jam, the small blind is folding about 68% of the time, and then the big blind is also folding another 60% of the time. So that's a pretty decent frequency of getting a fold even with seven bigs. If we drop the stack size to five big blinds, we can immediately see a slight difference from under the gun here. This is a product of the reduction in our fold equity. We're actually no longer able to shove 9-8 suited, even though we were shoving it when we had seven big blinds. This is partly because the big blind is now going to be folding about 60% of the time, instead of about 75% of the time. So we're much more reluctant to shove hands like nine high suited hands, which need fold equity in order to be profitable. The same trend is visible again from the button here. We're no longer shoving 7-6 suited because even though it has plenty of equity, the big blind's calling range is now so wide that we're getting called by a lot more dominating 7x and 6x hands right here. And also even king 6 and queen 6 offsuit. So that reduces our overall equity quite a bit here. If we drop the stack sizes again to three big blinds, we see some really interesting stuff. The big blind is now only folding to our under the gun shove about 3% of the time. So it's a very, very low folding frequency here. We've essentially lost our fold equity altogether. But take a look at how our range has altered. Pocket deuces and threes are actually no longer even jamming from under the gun for three big blinds. This seems crazy, but it's a product of the fact that these hands are almost always slightly worse than a flip when they get called. And they get a lot worse than that if we go multi-way, which we will when our shove is only for three big blinds. In addition, they double block the very small portion of hands which the big blind is actually folding, so they have even less fold equity than the rest of our range. By contrast, hands like king four suited through king seven suited, and even queen eight suited, and some of these other queen high and jack high suited hands, are actually happy to jam and get the big blind to call with a very wide range, because they're now actually getting called by so many hands that they're actually shoving for value. Even 9-8 suited and 8-7 suited are back into our range now because they're able to get called by worse 9 high and worse 8 high hands in the big blinds range that they actually do achieve some value now, as well as playing very well if we happen to go three ways or four ways. Interestingly, our fold equity when we shove from the button is the same here as it was when we shoved from under the gun we're only getting a fold about 3% of the time. Deuces and threes are now back in our range because they have fewer players to get through, but hands like 7-6 suited and 6-5 suited are still folding, even though they have plenty of equity if they get called by a fairly strong range, such as if we jam the button for eight big blinds or 10 big blinds, their equity against a nearly any two cards range is actually worse. 
So they're not jamming here, even for three big blinds. Jamming with 6-5 suited here actually loses just over a quarter of a big blind, which, when we're only three big blinds deep, is a massive loss. On the other hand, a hand like Queen-4 suited is making roughly a quarter of a big blind in profit here, simply because it can get called by so much jack high and worse, as well as some dominated 4x hands. There's so much more benefit to having a high card in our hand here compared to a suited connector. These dynamics are very important when we're playing extremely shallow stacked, and you'll find a lot of players will actually make big errors with their shoving ranges at this stack size. They'll assume that hands like 7-6 suited and 6-5 suited are more valuable than they are, while ignoring the benefit of high card, king high, and queen high hands. And they'll also be far too content to just put in their last three big blinds with any two cards in a random spot, and hope for the best. So let's now move on to looking at spots where we're facing an open raise outside of the blinds. For this, we're going to move on to looking at some of our ICM sims and get a sense of what happens once we get beyond the chip EV stage of the tournament. Here's a spot which I think is a great example of a really misunderstood aspect of micro stack play. In this scenario, there's 37% of the field left and a slightly above average stack of 35 big blinds is going to open from under the gun plus one at a nine handed table with this range. So under the gun eight, if you want to use the more modern term. We are in the low jack with five big blinds here. Before I show you what the strategy looks like, what do you think it's going to be? If you guessed the fourth option where we have a reasonably significant calling range, you'd be correct. But it sounds crazy to have a calling range off a five big blind stack with five players left to act. So let's examine why we might consider this option. It actually all comes down to the fact that the five players left to act behind us can actually help us out in this scenario. No matter what we do, we're not going to have any fold equity here. Clearly, the original Razor is not folding to our shove. But if we call, then there's a pretty big incentive for players behind us to 3-bet and isolate us, causing the original Razor to sometimes fold, and giving us a really good price to call off that last three big blinds. Obviously, we quite often end up going all in three ways here, but that's the reason we're mostly calling with hands which are going to have decent equity multi. There aren't really any circumstances here in which we would ever end up folding. Even if we somehow face the possibility of a four-way all-in pot, we're basically never folding. For example, if we call the hijack three bets, the button cold four bets, and then under the gun one player jams, we still are calling off 92% of our initial flatting range. So there's only a couple of hands that mix folds for that last three big blinds there. We're basically just never folding. But having a calling range with certain hands allows us to benefit from the possibility of players behind us knocking the original razor out of the pot, which can result in folding out some hands which are dominating our calling range. For example, let's say we call here with pocket fours, which is a pure call in this spot. When the hijack and cutoff fold, one potential circumstance is that the button then three bets to six big blinds here with a hand like ace 10 off, for example. Then the original razor, when it gets back around to them, ends up folding all their pocket pairs between fives and tens at a pretty high frequency because they can't afford to play a big pot against the player who covers them. And then, once they fold, we just call it off with our pocket fours, and now we end up in a flip against ace-10 off with the opportunity to potentially triple up, or almost triple up, if we win that flip. Now, obviously, this is just one of a multitude of possibilities, but the fact that the players behind us are bigger stacks and the original Razor is a middling stack allows us to benefit from those bigger stacks applying leverage here against that Razor. So we've covered facing a raise outside of the blinds, but what about in the blinds? Well, there are some interesting dynamics here as well. In particular, if we look at the small blind, we'll see a similar phenomenon to what we just observed. This is a spot where we're the small blind with 25% of the field remaining, and an above average stack opens from the under the gun two spot nine handed. We only have six big blinds here, but we're still playing a calling range of around 14% of hands. Why would we do this? Well, it comes down to the same principles. When we call, the big blind will 3-bet about 7% of the time here, which puts a lot of pressure on the original Razor and allows us to benefit from that Razor being forced out of the pot. 
The difference here is that we're getting a much better price when we're calling out of the small blind, so our calling range is much wider than it was in the low jack spot that we just looked at. And there's only one player behind who we have to worry about. You might be thinking, why would we call here when we're going to end up going multi-way to a flop so often? Well, the short answer is that doesn't actually matter very much. Going multi-way to a flop isn't something we're inherently afraid of. And in a spot like this where we would only have just over half pot behind going to the flop, we're basically just hoping to flop some equity and get it all in on the flop. Our decisions are going to be very easy and there's no real way for us to get denied our equity across multiple streets. So we can see that even off of a micro stack, we can quite easily have a calling range from the small blind. You would expect that this would be even more true from the big blind, and indeed that's exactly right. However, most players don't necessarily realize exactly how wide our big blind calling range starts to get once we're really shallow stacked. In situations without any kind of extreme risk premium, we're going to be defending the big blind really wide as a micro stack because we're getting such a good price, and it's so easy for us to realize most of our equity in a heads up pot when stacks are shallower. Let's take a look at an example. We're back to 37% of the field here, and this time we're in the big blind with a six big blind stack. We're facing an open from a bigger stack in the hijack with 48 big blinds. And in this spot, we're defending almost any two cards. The only hands we're folding are seven deuce off and six deuce off, as you can see down here. In addition, the range of hands we're jamming is actually really narrow. Even hands as strong as sevens and queen jack suited are playing pure call here. Why would this be the case? The answer lies in the fact that when we have no fold equity against the raise here, which we don't because you can see that they're calling our jam 100% of the time, we're basically faced with a fairly straightforward equation. Is our hand strong enough to benefit from being all in preflop here, or does it benefit from the opportunity to sometimes fold on a bad flop? As you can see, most hands are in the latter category here. The main reason why being all in preflop is beneficial in the first place is the guarantee of realizing all of our equity. So really what we're deciding between is realizing all of our equity for the price of our last five big blinds, or realizing most of our equity by seeing a flop for a price of one big blind. Since the latter option allows us to check fold when we flop no equity, the one big blind price is pretty acceptable here. In fact, there are two other benefits here that we haven't touched on yet, which it's easy to forget about. The first is that when we do call, sometimes our opponent is going to check behind on the flop, and we're actually going to see a turn card for free. Now this may not happen very much in practice, but it will happen sometimes, and it's certainly supposed to happen in theory. Take a look at this spot. If we defend preflop here and the flop comes queen three deuce with a flush draw, we can see that even if we give villain the option to either bet one big blind or shove for four big blinds, they're still checking back about 12% of the time here. If we remove the one big blind option and assume that they're just playing jam or check, that actually goes up to about 16% here. Now this isn't a lot, but it definitely counts for something, and we should realize that just because we only have a few big blinds behind, it doesn't mean that Villain is guaranteed to always put us all in on every single flop. And for that matter, we should recognize that just because they put us all in doesn't mean we're always calling off our last four big blinds either. In fact, if we look at our response against the jam here, we're only calling off about 40% of the time. We're folding hands as strong as king high with no backdoor, and we're also folding stuff that flops a gut shot, something like 6-5. Even with a diamond, we're actually folding fairly often here. So we can get away from these hands in this spot. We're never folding a pair or an 8-out draw, but we are able to get away from this flop a decent chunk of the time. The second surprising benefit of spots like this is that sometimes we actually win the pot uncontested, and in fact this might happen more often than you might expect. Let's imagine now that we're looking at a flop of jack 9 7 with a flush draw, we check our entire range and villain range bets for one big blind. If villain range bets and we play a strategy of call, fold, or jam, then when we jam, we are actually getting a fold about 9% of the time, and we're picking up a pot of almost 11 big blinds without a showdown. And that doesn't sound like a lot to win 9% of the time without a showdown, but it is meaningful, and when we're trying to maximize our EV, every little helps. On top of that, we also have to consider possibilities like maybe villain bets one big blind and we call. Let's see what happens there. And maybe we get a favorable turn card, like for example the eight of hearts. And if that happens, the solver actually now wants us to jam the turn with basically 100% of our range for our last three big blinds. But when we do that, villain is actually now forced to fold about 
30% of the time, which is kind of a lot. It's a lot in comparison to the fact that we might otherwise be assuming that we never get to win this pot without showdown. And of course, if we do see our opponent check back the flop, sometimes we can jam the turn and they fold. So we shouldn't just assume that it's impossible to have any post-flop play off a micro stack here. There is more scope for post-flop play in the big blind than you might think, even when our stack is extremely small. Players who don't defend wide enough pre-flop or who are never willing to do things like calling a one big blind bet and seeing a turn with three big blinds behind are leaving a surprising amount of EV on the table. So that about wraps it up for this video. Please do go ahead and drop a like on this video and subscribe to our channel. It does help us to keep bringing you the best content here on YouTube that we possibly can. If you're looking for some more content that might help you with some short stack spots, check out this video right here from Tombos21 where you can learn all about post-flop ICM. I'll be back soon with another video and in the meantime, good luck wizards.